A little more than 30 years ago, I was perusing some extra biblical text. I came across the book of Barnabas. And as I finished the book of Barnabas, something caught my attention. It was concerning the trial of Yeshua, and the accusation against him was, he does his healings on the Sabbath. That immediately caught my attention, and so I went back and I read Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, uh, right straight through and looking, and there was only one time that I, I could prove that he was not healing on the Sabbath, that he healed on a different day of the week. But it certainly caught my attention because he is the Lord of the Sabbath, and he did his healings on the Sabbath, and he broke Pharisee law on the Sabbath, but he never broke the law of the Almighty. He never broke the commandment concerning the Sabbath. And I saw that that day, so sanctified and set apart by the Almighty, was again reinforced by Yeshua, that he was again saying, this is the day of healing. This is the day of reconciliation. This is a day that our heavenly Father has set aside to meet with us and to heal us from all our diseases, social, physical, financial. Well, it is now the end of the sixth day. The sun is set. If this is a Sabbath, and this is Shabbat Night Live! It's Shabbat Night Live from Charlotte, North Carolina, with your host, Michael Rood. Join Michael and co host Scott Lair as they welcome musical guest Steve Ladd. Now, here he is, the Messianic Matador. Michael Ruth. Ah, Shabbat Shalom, Torah fans. Good Sabbath to all the followers of Yeshua Messiah out there in cyberspace and watching this program, Shabbat Night Live via television in more than 160 countries around the globe and also available interplanetarily on In Cyberspace. We welcome you to Shabbat Night Live. We're coming direct to you from Studio A in the Aviv Moon Studios in Charlotte, North Carolina, having moved our studios from Jerusalem to Charlotte, North Carolina, and now this is the Messianic Disneyland of planet Earth. We thank you for joining us for the Leaven Free Gospel of the Kingdom. Here, there's no rabbinic takanot that Yeshua said, do not follow the takanot of the Pharisees. There is no Babylonian sun worship with all of the pagan accoutrements that came right straight out of Babylon through Constantine into modern day churchianity, and there is no papal bull since I ran for Pope and didn't make it. So this is a no man-made religion zone where we are contending for the faith once delivered to the saints because it was being degraded and lost before the end of the first century. And this is exactly what Jude, the brother of Yeshua, wrote in his short epistle to earnestly contend for that faith once delivered to the saints. And that is why we are going back to the Hebrew roots of the faith. We're going past rabbinic Judaism. We're not stopping off. We are going right past paganized Constantinian Christianity. We're going back to the faith and back to the gospel of the kingdom that Yeshua taught. And if you are interested in the truth, you're in the right place. If you're interested in religion, because I know many of you are watching this on religious television stations, change the channel, go someplace else because we don't like religion here. We're after the truth. And I am an equal opportunity offender, and I'd like you to welcome with me the executive director of the Chronological Gospels International Relations, another equal opportunity offender, Dr. Scott Laird. <laughs> Scott. Please be an offender. Yeah. Well, well, this is, uh, is, it's good to have you here. We've got a lot of exciting things that are happening with the Chronological Gospels. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, you've got, uh, you introduced it last week. I, I came back from, uh, uh, from Israel and uh, you let me know, uh, well, 
I guess it was a couple weeks ago that you put it in place. Uh, Tell us what's going on with the chronological gospels out there to help people get in sync with the biblical reckoning of time. Well, we have the gospel timeline text alerts. And what that's about is that uh, you can sign up at thechronologicalgospels.com or go to chronogospels.com. It's the same thing. And you look on the right-hand side and there's the gospel timeline text alerts. And you can click on that, enter in your name and your telephone number. And what you'll get is a text alert every time there's a significant event in history that happened on that day in Yeshua's mm-hmm. life, mm-hmm. which is really neat. So, for example, uh, this week, if you sign up now, uh, you'll get a text alert to within the week telling you that Yeshua is in the midst of his 40-day fast in the desert. And you can correlate that date with uh, your biblical calendar. So you have your biblical That's calendar. Right. You can look it up, and you'll look at today's date. You look there, and you can correlate that with the, uh, the Hebrew date, Uh, of the Hebrew calendar. And then you can look it up in your chronological gospels and read the whole story about it. And you can also look it up on your timeline and see exactly where Yeshua was in his ministry on this day in history. It's really kind of cool. Oh, that, that, that is. And uh, on this very event, till while he is in the wilderness, of course, Matthew, Mark, and Luke all record this event, but none of them were out there with him. You know, they were the ones that, uh, uh, the the scribes that wrote down the first-hand witness of Yeshua and exactly what took place. And this is where it starts out in the chronological gospels where where all three gospel authors, every word that they say about this event is all there for you to see. And this is where uh, some people bring in apparent contradictions. Hmm. And so what we do is in the chronological gospels explain these apparent contradictions in the English text and so that we can get back to the original exactly what transpired, because only when you have all of the gospel records, every gospel author giving their particular perspective when you put them all together, then you have the full screenplay. And that's why in the chronological gospels, more than 300 individual incidents in the life and ministry of Yeshua, every single word from the King James, this is the corrected King James, then we take you back into the Greek, then we step back, you know, when we're dealing with Matthew into the Hebrew, and of course we have the context of the land, the language, the culture of Israel, and that is the footnotes that make this uh, the size of a Bible, but it's Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, and the Revelation. Right. So this is at a very exciting time, and it's also, we're coming up on Purim at the end of his ministry. Yes, we we're mm-hmm. coming up on the time of Purim, and this is the time uh, that, that he went up and raised Lazarus from the dead. Right, yes, yes, and, and, and uh, waited. Uh, that, that's right, and so, you know, we are encouraging everyone. I don't know if I, ah, uh, yes, I have it right here. Um, this is Purim, the Making of a King's Bride. This is five episodes, it's six discs, and it includes our Purim party uh, in which we acted this whole thing out. This is an absolute hoot, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, the uh, this is the primary marriage and uh, a marital relations uh, seminar for this ministry. And it is, it is more than that, far more than that. And so when you really understand the relationship that, that is established and how a man and a woman are to relate to each other, and it didn't go well with Akashvrosh and Vashti, as we see <laughs> uh, in the book of Esther, but we do see some principles laid down in here. And so it took us five weeks to do that, and then the then our final Purim party. So we encourage you to get this, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, get your friends, family, get your enemies, everyone together, and watch this together study it together, and then have your own Purim party. We're going to, of course, on Messianic.tv, uh, having our Purim party again this year. Uh, so, you know, and this is something that we enjoy and will enjoy as the entire staff gets together for this uh, momentous occasion. But uh, then we've got you know, something I'm really looking forward to. We've got to talk about it now before okay. we even get to the calendar. And What's that is Passover. Ah, yes. That's, that's one of the first things that you attended as far as one of our Passover extravaganzas. And, uh, you know, a lot lot of people think that, you know, it's just sitting around a table. But this is a pageant. It is. Yeah, you you get to live Passover. You don't just read about it. You don't just hear about it. You, you, you're in there, and it's, it's like going back. That's right. Back in it, time. Everything that we can do to make that this is an interactive event for all the way from small children all the way to the great, great grandparents. And you really get to live Passover in the first century. 
and, and you, you, you get to taste it and feel it like nothing else that you could possibly do. Ladies and gentlemen, you could not do this at home. It takes a staff of 30 people in order to do this with the dancers, with everything else that goes into it, the triumphal entry of the king. I mean, ladies and gentlemen, the king is coming. Is this event this year for Passover. You've got to be here, you gotta make this thing happen. We're gonna talk about the timing of that just a little bit later, but I wanna give you a little bit of technology update for those of you who are just joining us. We are on the new network, which is on your internet, which is w.messianic.tv, and that begins at 8 p.m. Eastern Time, Friday evening, at the beginning of this program, and then it repeats immediately afterwards at 10 o'clock for the, the left coast for uh, California, and at eight o'clock Eastern Time is when our new programming begins for the week, 20 bars a day, seven days a week. This is in-depth teaching on the word of the Almighty. This is the revival of which Jeremiah prophesied for the last days, that the Gentiles would come unto Israel from the ends of the earth, cry out in repentance for the abominations they inherited from their forefathers, and the Almighty promises that he will reveal his hand, his might, and even the Gentiles will know his name. And I'm not gonna say it now, because you need to be involved in this last day revival. It's not a revival about filling church pews to overflowing and the offering plates uh, can't, can't hold all the money. That's not the revival. It's a revival of the heart it is turning back to the ancient paths, the Hebrew roots of the faith, and leaving behind man-made religion. And we are inviting you to be part of this with Messianic.tv. Uh, we're also on Roku. You can get your little Roku box, turn it on your high definition television, go to Messianic.tv. Again, alive, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Our live program is on it, and then our regular program. Inspiration Network International. We're on in more than 160 countries. We're also on Roku on INI. And also, we carry both Shabbat Night Live and A Rude Awakening on that. A live stream, we're on high definition broadband and uh, on Roku, you go to the live stream channel and Messianic.tv is there as well. YouTube, we have a high definition archive on the Root Awakening channel and on the Root Awakening.tv website, we're in high definition and audio only for those who have a lower bandwidth. iTunes, downloadable podcast in full high definition and A Root Awakening from Israel, our original program, half hour program from the land of Israel with all of the great archeological finds, that is on TBN's the Church Channel, which is our primary prison outreach, and anyone else out there in bondage. Uh, also, TBN and LASE. We are on in every Spanish uh, country in the world, on in LASE. The Gospel Channel in Europe, uh, Omega Television in Iceland, or Roberts University, which is now a GEB America network, and we're all over Canada with now Hope TV Canada. So GEB and Hope TV, we just added on this last month and our next big goal. Daystar bought out Middle East TV, both of those networks seen in Israel and the Middle East. Ladies and gentlemen, I wanna be on there with Shabbat Night Live. You heard about it uh, the week before last as we were talking about this. The, we are breaking ground in the land of Israel. The encouragement is coming from the Orthodox. They love the program because I'm telling it like it is. Even if they don't like it, they love me telling it like it is. Now all these broadcasts, all of them, are made available by our Ambassador Club members. If you can't afford to be an Ambassador Club member by, by giving $100 or more a month and pledging that to us, then please give what you can. Be a part of this ministry. We are freely giving of that which cost us a great deal to reach you, and if your life is being changed, we need you to stand with us. You're responsible to stand with us. If we're feeding you, don't muzzle the ox. Give me some food because I'm just getting it out to more and more people around the world. So Scott, tonight, 
On Shabbat Night Live, we have the author of the Astronomically and Agriculturally Corrected Biblical Hebrew Calendar with us for a calendar update. We have viewer mail from cyberspace, I understand. Yes, we have some very good questions I this week. I think it's mm -hmm. coming in right, right away. Yep. Uh, our Israel update, and uh, we've got someone filling in for Ariel Estegal, who is on, on uh, assignment with, I think, with the Mossad. Uh, and uh, also, <laughs> we have a rude review with Annie and Laura, and a special musical guest, our Messianic Minstrel this week is Steve. Vlad. Our teaching from here to eternity, the good news of the apocalypse and the demise of the new world order, pre-title, the mark of the beast and the new world order. This is what you've been waiting for. This is the question that came up last week. What is the mark of the beast? We are going to be going into this very thing. Well, uh, we are going to be touching on, I think, the, uh, the calendar right now, the astronomically and agriculturally corrected biblical Hebrew calendar. Please take this gem. And again, we're still in the same year until the barley is of Eve. So just because the pagan calendar changes in January, I don't live according to the pagan calendar, okay? Janus, the two-headed God who looks back at the past and forward to the future, all this uh, pagan nonsense. No, we're going by the biblical calendar. And this calendar, if you'll open it up, and if you only know the pagan calendar, you look at the date, and what is the date? It is January 31st. And we have now, we're going to find out, uh, well, hopefully even before it, it ends, if we have seen the new moon in the land of, of Israel. And uh, here we are on the end of the 11th month, beginning of the 12th month on the biblical calendar. That means at this point, we have three weeks to pour them on the corrected calendar. Now remember, on the rabbinic calendar, they always celebrate it in the last month of the year, but before a calculated calendar was put in place in 359 of the Common Era, by the act of the Sanhedrin just before disbanding, when they added a 13th month onto the year by mathematical logarithm, they always celebrate Purim in the last month of the year. Honestly, during the temple period, we never knew when there was going to be a 13th month of the year, so it's always done in the 12th month of the year, and that's when we're celebrating it, Purim, this month, okay? We've got 11 weeks to Passover, and uh, 15 weeks to our Israel tour, 18 weeks to Shavuot, and so that means that between Passover and Shavuot, we have our Israel tour, just a few seats left. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the tour of a lifetime, get on it. Watch the, uh, the, the, the bit that uh, uh, Florence and I did uh, that's available on YouTube to find out more about this. And then we have 43 weeks to the Aegean Sea, seven assemblies of the apocalypse, and the School of Tyrannus two-week cruise and tour of Asia Minor. Ladies and gentlemen, there are so many things come up, do not miss this. Well, we're gonna take a, a short break because we have a message for our sponsors which are all of you out there. This is the only message you're gonna get, so stay with us. We'll see you in a minute. After 40 years of labor, including three decades of restoring the ancient biblical Hebrew calendar, together with the experiences that accompany years of living in Jerusalem and the Galilee, Michael Rood presents the inspired gospel records in chronological order to enrich your lifetime quest for truth. The chronological gospels piece together the life and ministry of the Messiah in a way no one has ever seen before. It reveals depth, beauty, and truth in the word that could never be understood until it was put together to tell the story as it happened, complete and chronological. And now you can order your copy today. You can get the chronological gospels in three different ways. For your purchase of $69, you can order your own copy of the Chronological Gospels Bible. Or for your purchase of $117, you can receive the Chronological Gospels Essential Package, which includes the Chronological Gospels Bible, the Chronological Gospels 4 DVD set, Chronological Gospels chart, or for your purchase of $347, you can receive the Chronological Gospels Scholars Package, which includes the Chronological Gospels Bible, the Chronological Gospels 4 DVD set, Chronological Gospels chart, the astronomically and agriculturally corrected Hebrew travel calendar, Creator's Calendar DVD, Spring and Fall Feasts DVDs, Raiders of the Lost Book DVD, 
Hebrew Yeshua versus Greek Jesus? Who was your unauthorized covering DVD? Mystery of Iniquity. Great Secret of Solomon's Temple DVD. If you purchased each item separately, you would pay over $444. Call today to receive your copy of the Chronological Gospels Bible or package sent. Don't miss your opportunity to be blessed in the ways of the Messiah. Call or visit our website today. Well, Scott, I think uh, everyone needs to get the entire uh, scholar's package on that. Uh, just go down to your banker, get a loan out, tell them that you're gonna be going to seminary, but instead of sending, spending the next six year in Bible school in seminary, all you have to do is spend about two months and you'll learn more than you would in the next six years going to a traditional school. So get it, learn it, run it day and night, and uh, you will reap the benefits for the rest of your life. Well, Scott, uh, you know, with these upcoming events, uh, these feasts that we have coming up, uh, as it says in Hebrews, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together as a manner of some is. It, right, has, right. it has nothing to do with going to church on Sunday. There was no such thing. It's the book of Hebrews. Shaul is writing to Messianic Jews near the end of the period of time in which the temple is, uh, is going to be destroyed in a few years, and the Yom Kippur sacrifice has already been shown to be ineffectual causing both Pharisaic Judaism and the Messianic Jews to have questions what happened to the miracle that happened every year on Yom Kippur? Why did it cease the very year that Yeshua was crucified? What happened? And so it details this. And even though there are things that, uh, you know, the, the sacrifice, the blood of bulls and goats and lambs and rams, which cannot pay for sin, it's only a continual reminder that the death penalty is owed by the offending party. And when Yeshua paid the death penalty for the offending party, mm -hmm. he then could renew the covenant with us. And now he's forever seated on the right hand of the Almighty, making intercession for us, but we don't forsake the assembling of ourselves together. The feast of the Lord are the most beautiful, the, 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 the deepest, the richest experience afforded the follower of the true Messiah that we have in this lifetime, ladies and gentlemen. Don't miss out on this. This is not pr primarily a family affair where everyone gets together and eats shrimp and pig. Okay, this, these are the feasts of the Lord. They belong to him. And at our Passover extravaganza, we are going to gather together here in Charlotte, North Carolina, April 18th through 20th, the entire weekend when we conclude the feast with Yom HaBikarim, the day of the first fruits. That's when it actually uh, happened and would happen in the temple period. Uh, and the first night of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, when the Passover lamb is eaten, will be either April 14th or 15th, depending on the, the new moon sighting of March 31st. And so that's the night to celebrate that evening with your family. We encourage you, get our video on Passover, even put it on and enjoy it with us, and then head out to Charlotte, like it's Mount Sinai, Head out to Charlotte and we're all gonna get together and we are going to have a, a triumphal event for, uh, and we're gonna have a Passover Seder when we're all together. Now, of course, we uh, have the Elders at the Gates Men's Fellowship, uh, which is uh, happening just this, uh, this next weekend, which is uh, uh, the first and third Sunday of every month at 10 a.m at the Arute Awakening headquarters. That's just men. Get Real with Lee and Annie is on the Aviv Moon Network. And also we are now interrupting and bringing that in live as it was done uh, just a couple weeks ago. Uh, it was brought in live on Messianic.tv at that very hour. So our technology continues to increase to where we can do these things. Otherwise, uh, you can watch every second and fourth Tuesday of each month, seven o'clock Eastern time. That's the night that the men and watch the children, and your wives will love you for that. Now, uh, coming up next, uh, we, we're, we're gonna be talking about a guest that we're going to ha be having on next week, but I wanna tell you, ladies and gentlemen, right here, Lessons for Healthy Living, I am biting the bullet on this thing. I am going for it. We're gonna have Dr. Jeff Azim on next week, and next week, uh, uh, all you who want to join me in taking the big step and, and making this part of the lifestyle, no more excuses, no too busy to live 
and so we slowly kill ourselves. No, we are taking this 24 module uh, uh, a plan over the next three months, and so I encourage you to get it. This week, Lessons for Healthy Living, and Dr. Jeff Azim will be with us next week. Well, Scott, what do we have from Cyberspace with viewer mail this week? We have some questions that not necessarily come from Cyberspace. Oh, it sounds like it's coming in right now. Well, one, uh, one question has landed in, uh, in Jamaica, of all places. Jamaica? Yeah, a, a, a fellow named, uh, we're not sure if it's Yasun or Jason, we'll call him Yasun. Uh, yeah, Probably son. not a name his mother gave him. Yeah, son, okay. <laughs> yeah. Son of Yah. Okay. Son of Yah. <laughs> okay. I am a Christian and have been in recent discussions with some individuals who believe that the Tetragrammaton, that is the yod heh vav -He, is of corrupt origin. Please give me some historical information with which I can counter their arguments as they also reject that Yeshua is the name of the one whom they call Jesus. Okay, well, it sounds like your friends in Jamaica have been smoking a little bit too much ganja down there, okay? <laughs> uh, you, you know, Shaul had to deal with this thing, and he said, uh, avoid stupid questions and endless genealogies and old wise fables. Th this is what we would call an absolute stupid question, all right? It does not even deserve an answer. Do not get thrown off by complete morons. And these people that are saying this, that the uh, yod heh vav -Hey, that's of corrupt origins, they have no idea what they're talking about. And, and they want you to prove it and you want me to prove it, I'm giving you a, a heads up on this, okay? You don't answer stupid questions. The world is full of idiots out there complete biblical illiterates, historical illiterates, they can make up anything they want. Don't waste your time with them, okay? This is, uh, th this is like uh, the, the atheist, how they came up with, uh, uh, you know, their religion is, is evolution. But, you know, scientifically, evolution doesn't explain anything, okay? Right, yeah. it, it scientifically, it's so, uh, you know, it, it, it has no merit at all. And so they know this. And so they come up with uh, other ways for how life started because it can't start the way that they try to propose this. So they come up with directed transpanspermia, okay? And this is where life on earth was seeded from another life form, another culture, coming through space on spacecraft or whatever, and then seeding life, and then it started with the seeds of life here and started going, okay? Now, when someone comes up with an explanation like that, that immediately you have to respond with the same question that started out, well, where did that life come from? As soon as you know that, you know that they are treating you like an idiot, okay? They think you're a moron and that you're gonna take the bait. No, that is absolutely ridiculous. Okay, we can make up anything and now I have to answer it. No, I don't have to answer complete idiots. You know, Yeshua said that the reason for eternal life is that we might know the one true God and the Messiah whom he has sent. Now, Yeshua also said, and this is just an absolutely, just one of the most important statements that we read about in the, the, uh, the Gospels, it says, no one knows the Father but the Son, and to whom the Son will reveal him. You know, it doesn't matter how much uh, pot they're smoking down there in Jamaica, you know, don't answer stupid questions. This is exactly what the scripture tells us. Shaul deals with idiots all the time, okay? And he's telling us how to deal with them. Some things you don't even dignify with an answer, and that is your answer. Yes, all right, we have about uh, just a couple of minutes to answer a question from Ooh, Karen. Okay. What is the chronology of the anointings of Yeshua's feet spoken in uh, Matthew 26, 6 and 7, Mark, Luke, and John? How many different occasions occurred? Okay. Because it looks uh, like more uh, than uh, one. Okay, yes, there is more than one here. And so when we have this particular uh, incident, we have this on page, uh, I, I made a, a note on here, uh, page 220 in your chronological gospels. Because uh, again, people who are 
not aware of the chronology, seem to link things together, and this is, you know, similar things they make identical, and identical things they make similar sometimes, just because of the wording in the English language. And so when we take a look at this, we see that it is on page, uh, yeah, 220. Uh, page 220, yep. and this is note number 18. This is, uh, note number 18 goes back to, this is a parenthetical re statement recalling the anointing of oil in Bethany. And it gives us a note to go back to incident number 160. So when we go back to incident number uh, 160, here we should find that not too far back here, yeah, because it's right at the beginning of Yeshua's week the, the end of his uh, 60th week, hey, and we have, it says, Miriam anoints Yeshua's head and feet at supper in Shimon's house in Bethany. And we are given exactly the, the time of this, uh, that this takes place. It tells us in John chapter 12, verse one, six days before Passover, Yeshua approached Bet Tiana where Lazarus lived. This was the same man who had died and whom Yeshua had raised from the dead. And then the next one, there in Betina, they made a supper. Martha served and Lazarus was one of those who reclined at the table with them. And Miriam took a pound of spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Yeshua and wiped his feet with her hair. Now, they're asking, is this the same thing with, that we have in Luke chapter seven? We go to Luke chapter seven, and this is all the way back on week 25, where we're in week 63 now. Hmm. We go back to week 25, and we're going to take a look at uh, incident number 76. And here, Yeshua has supper with a Pharisee named Shimon. And an unnamed woman washes Yeshua's feet with tears and anoints them with oil. This happens in week 25. This is between Shavuot and Yom Teruah. It's in the, the summertime. And this woman washes his feet with her tears, with a tear bottle that had been saved up, and then anoints them with, with, uh, with oil. This is a completely different event. Now here is where it becomes very important. We go back to incident 160. John gives us the timing of this event, and it is immediately after Yeshua enters in Beit Tiana, uh, the house of early figs, and it is there at supper, and that is when she anoints his, his feet with oil. Now, Matthew and Mark, Matthew and Mark do not reported at that time. Matthew and Mark report it, at, uh, and it is written just before incident number 179, where Yeshua agree, uh, Yehudas agrees to betray Yeshua for the slave price of 30 pieces of silver. And this is why they put it in this part of their narrative, because the incident of her anointing his feet with very expensive ointment Judas is the one that stands up against it and says, this should have been sold and the money given to the poor. And it says, this spake he, not because he cared anything for the poor, but because he was a thief and he bore or stole that which was in the bag or the common purse of the disciples. And that is the reward of iniquity, what he was stealing, that he bought the parcel of land with mm. that he eventually hung himself on. Why do they put it here? Because it is put right here so that we see the reason why he is going out to betray Yeshua for the slave price of 30 pieces of silver because he's getting more money. He's a thief. And that is why it's put there. But the actual event took place just before his triumphal entry, which is gonna transpire the next morning on Shabbat. Remember, the triumphal entry, there is no such thing as Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday is complete fiction. It was on the Shabbat that year, the 10th day of the month of the Aviv. So I think we ran a little bit over mm -hmm. time and we'll try to make things up for you a little bit later. Uh, thank you for being with us and we've got another word for those to help us bring it to the world.
Around the world today, people are hungry for answers. They're asking, who am I? Is this all that I am? And praying to gods of wood and stone who cannot hear and will not answer. Who will help them understand? As followers of the Messiah, we know the truth, the truth that sets men free, the truth about the Elohim of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And the gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. On November 2nd, 2012, A Root Awakening International began to take the word of the Messiah to over 150 countries around the world. Now you can partner with Michael Rood to sponsor one of these countries. Your sponsorship will help cover the cost of staying on the air in the country of your choice. Today, you can join the Ambassadors Club by sponsoring a country for as little as $100 per month or a one-time gift of $1,200. I am sponsoring Marshall Islands. We're going to sponsor Cyprus. I'm sponsoring Canada. Michael Rood's teachings are absolutely like nothing that we've ever experienced before. This is joyous, and it's not just the joy, but you have that inner peace knowing that you're doing what Jehovah tells you to do. If your life has been blessed, if you've been ministered to by this ministry, then we are asking you to step in and support this ministry. I'm sponsoring Columbia because I love Michael Root's ministry, and I hope God opens the door right where Columbia's heart is at, and I hope the word spreads. What are the souls of your brethren worth to you? Call today with your monthly gift of $100 or a one-time gift of $1,200 and partner with Michael as a member of the Ambassadors Club. Together, we can bring it to the world. Come join Michael Rood and the entire Rood crew for Passover 2014 at the Renaissance Charlotte Suites Hotel in Charlotte, North Carolina, April 18th, 19th, and 20th. Enjoy great teachings from Michael Rood, Arthur Bailey, and more. And join us Saturday evening for our Passover Seder, Dinner with the King of Kings. Visit arudeawakening.tv slash Passover 2014 to get your Passover tickets now. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this is the end of the month and our January love gift. Uh, we, we picked this out specially uh, for you. Um, you. You know, uh, since second grade, I've always used a fountain pen and, and uh, it, it's just a, a way for me to write creatively. I don't like to do it with a computer. I never use a ballpoint pen. Uh, except in a dire emergency. And so I thought that you would enjoy experiencing this as well. First of all, if you're going to write the Hebrew script, uh, you know, this is part of the love gift here. If you're gonna write the Hebrew script, you need a pen that's appropriate for this, that's got a broader nib on it. And so we included a calligraphy set to go along with this and some calligraphy ink. And uh, also with this uh, from my good friend, Al Rodriguez uh, in the land of Israel, an artist over there who's been a great support of the ministry, a good personal friend through the years, just passed away uh, just last month. And we have these note cards as a gift, a pack of note cards that are all beautiful watercolors uh, from the vantage point of my home in the Galilee, overlooking the Sea of Galilee. And we know that you're going to love these. And you can write notes to your friends using your calligraphy pen and uh, with the feather pen or the wood stylus. And then, oh, this is a real treat for those of you who like a letter opener. I suggest you give two love gifts and uh, so that you've got two of these. So if you have small children, uh, they can have sword fights with each other, okay? Well, uh, maybe you want to keep this out of the hands of small children, okay? But uh, a beautiful letter opener, uh, a two-edged sword that uh, the inscription is from Hebrews 4.12, for the word of Yah is quick. It's living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. It discerns between the thoughts and the intents of the heart, and, uh, and this is the, the love gift that we have for you, and just a way of us saying thank you for your participation in this ministry. If you don't want to receive it, you know, please say. Now, you can call in any time and make a donation, and unless you ask specifically for it, we're not going to send it to you. So you're not obligated 
to take this love gift, but uh, a lot of people, the first time that, uh, that we have contact with you, that you decided to support the ministry, we want something that you remember us by, and every time you open a letter, you'll remember it, and, uh, and so that's why we're doing that. Well, ladies and gentlemen, tonight, our Alice Gaul is on assignment. I don't know where she is, the Mossad called, and, uh, and uh, I don't know what's, what's going on, but we have our special correspondent, Allison Floyd, bringing us our Inside Israel Report. Allison, take it away. Thank you, Michael. Welcome to Inside Israel for Shabbat Night Live. Arielis de Gaulle is away on assignment. I'm Allison Floyd. The Israeli-based home carbonation system company, SodaStream, has announced its first ever global brand ambassador. American actress Scarlett Johansson will be featured in SodaStream's next commercial ad, which is set to air at the Super Bowl on February the 2nd, 2014. The Jewish A-lister gladly accepted the home soda maker's offer and has a strong love for their products. The partnership between me and SodaStream is a no-brainer, said Johansson. I'm beyond thrilled to share my enthusiasm for SodaStream with the world. In other news, Israel has just opened its first 3D printing store. 3D printing is one of the latest technologies to be released into the consumer world. The 3D factory is a one-of-a-kind store in Tel Aviv. High-end 3D printers are used to create items such as lamps, lunch boxes, faces, and even candy and gum. Partners with the store are thrilled with the response from the community and have plans to expand into a franchise. 2014 already seems to be a great year of first for the land of Israel. I'm special correspondent Allison Floyd. Thank you for joining me for this week's edition of Inside Israel. Thank you so much, Allison. Well, we expect that the chronological gospels are going to cause some controversy out there. Uh, are they, Scott? They are indeed. In fact, you know, when you learn something new like this, that Yeshua's ministry was only 70 weeks, that blows a lot of theories out of the water. So, of course, there's going to be some questions. Some people are going to be angry with what they thought they knew, et cetera, et cetera. One of the most popular questions I'm getting right now uh, has to do with one of the, uh, the items that makes the 70 week um, chronology make sense, and that is John 6 4. And some people mm -hmm. are saying, How dare you say that it does not belong in the Bible? Uh, how can you depend on this one manuscript, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera? But uh, what do we say to that uh, just off the bat? Well, uh, being angry, uh, this, this is a common malady, a common, pro uh, common problem for pastors who, you know, went through all the schooling, been in the pulpit for 40 years and still can't count to three. And then they watch the Jonah Code or they read the Chronological Gospels and they get angry because they realize they've been lied to their whole life. And, uh, and they had promulgated that, and, and it's understandable. I think we all get upset when we find out that Santa Claus really doesn't exist. It doesn't matter what age we learn that. And uh, when it comes to the chronological gospels, uh, you know, I'm gonna open up to page three here because this is very important that you read the introduction. This is the thesis, ladies and gentlemen, and this thesis has not been broken by anyone. Before turning to the first page of the Chronological Gospels, there's one problem that must be addressed. Most of the Christian world has grown up with the concept that Yeshua's ministry was three and one half years in duration. However, no scholar has ever been able to prove this hypothesis, and in fact, the plain text of the Gospel narrative proves that a three and a half year ministry is a mathematical impossibility. The three and a half year ministry construct is a theological invention of an age old religious system that offers absolutely no proof for that which it demands its adherents blindly accept. Furthermore, this eschatological creation has tragically destroyed the gospel chronology and heavily veiled the gospel of the kingdom that Yeshua taught. And then the first line of the second paragraph, it was Eusebius who first proposed a three and a half year ministry more than 300 years after the resurrection of Yeshua. And here is the, the important thing, ladies and gentlemen, that for more than 300 years, there was not one dissenting opinion that Yeshua's ministry was about one year. So when one person comes on the scene, 
the champion of Constantine, who wrote the oration in exaltation of the Emperor Constantine, who then proclaimed himself to be the Pontifex Maximus, which is the official title of the high priest of paganism, and then pronounces himself as almighty God upon the earth, the vicar of Christ and his spiritual descendants, Okay, right then we know that we have got a taint that's been added into it and denying more than 300 years of testimony from the apostles, those who learned from the apostles, and now come up with this idea that Jesus' ministry is three and a half years, which is one half of a week, and that's exactly what he wrote in Demonstratio Evangelistica 8 and page 106, in paragraph eight, this is what he wrote. Ladies and gentlemen, he is the one that invented a three and a half year ministry and the reason why you're so attached to it is because you're afraid to think for yourself. Now, John 6, 4, we have text. The one that I quote in this particular uh, uh, book, this is in the museum at the home of the Archbishop of Canterbury. H.R. Shrivner, one of the most respected Greek scholars of all time, says this singular manuscript, minuscule manuscript, that's in the Lambeth Palace Museum is by far the most important manuscript in all that museum. Why? It goes back to a family of manuscripts that go back to before the words of John 6, 4 were added to later text. See, we have no originals. We have families of manuscripts that are copies of copies of copies of copies. There is another manuscript that is in Germany, and on my trip over there this, uh, this spring, mm -hmm. uh, because I have a daughter that's gonna be having a baby uh, right. over there in Germany, uh, and so we're gonna go over there and secure that manuscript as well as the one there so that we have the actual photographs of this, but the words that are added to John 6, 4 in all the later manuscripts and the feast and Passover, a feast of the Jews was nigh, was not in any of those manuscripts. Okay, now that brings up an interesting question. Okay. Uh, now, so it appears, because this, this manuscript came around around the 13th century, correct? So that, you're that's saying right. that, because some people are arguing that, well, obviously that that verse was in there before the 13th century, and this is the first one to- Certainly. Okay, so how do we answer so that? So it's a family of manuscripts. In other words, it's a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy because you can't go much before the, the, the see, we don't have any manuscripts of the first four centuries. Mm -hmm. they, they don't exist, they're dust, okay? So you have copies of copies of copies. So here is one thing that we see. There's John chapter two and three is Passover. John chapter 12 is Passover. If the manuscripts in the first 300 years had another Passover in John 6, 4, right in the middle, none of these historians for 300 years would have been so stupid as to not understand it would take well over two years to fulfill three Passovers. It's simple mathematics. Mm. You have the testimony of all of the early church fathers and historians saying his ministry was about one year and the manuscript of John that they were reading could not possibly have had John 6, 4 in it. Now we come to the real breaker. Right here on this uh, particular situation, we have in all four gospels, the feeding of the 5,000 takes place at the end of the summer when the 12 apostles return from their paired assignments throughout the villages of the Galilee. Okay, that's when the feeding of the 5,000 takes place. All four gospel authors record that one miracle. It is the only miracle recorded by all four gospel authors. It happens in the middle of Yeshua's ministry. And with all of them recording it, it gives us a singular moment in time that everything can be coordinated at that very moment. Now, the next chapter in John, chapter seven, Yeshua is going up to the Feast of Tabernacles. The same chapter in Matthew, he's going to the Feast of Tabernacles. The next chapter in Matthew, Mark, he's going to Tabernacles. The, the next chapter in Luke, he's going to Tabernacles. Because it's at the end of the summer, the next Feast is Tabernacles. And they added, 
scribes added, and this is universal, this happens, uh, we can take you back and show you the manuscripts, we've got about 5,000 extant manuscripts on the planet in the Greek language, and we can show you where scribes added things in, they left things out, they took things out, they moved entire sections, such as uh, the woman in the trial of adultery in John chapter eight, it's in John chapter seven in most of the older manuscripts. And so we can show that these things were moved and that they changed them. They didn't change many, but when they did change them, this one, they got caught red-handed. Because when you know the feast, you know Yeshua is not going to stay in the Galilee and feed thousands of people with leavened bread during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. He's not gonna go to the Capernaum Synagogue two days later and preach to a full house when everyone is supposed to be at Jerusalem for the feast. Three days later, he feeds another 4,000 with leavened barley loaves, and the Pharisees show up from Jerusalem to confront him on why his disciples are not taking the two-handled negel vesser and washing their hands before they eat bread. He never goes to Jerusalem, but what happens in the same chapter in Matthew, the next chapter in John, he's up to the Feast of Tabernacles. They got caught red-handed, ladies and gentlemen. Now the gospel record fits, and it took me 40 years to get it. If you think you can pull this thing off, if you think you can answer and handle every contradiction in the English text of the Bible, good luck, Einstein. It took me 40 years to do it, and here it is, and all, it's, it's, it's only, what, $75,000 for each copy, and it's a bargain at that. So get it, and no more complaining about it whether John 6, 4, they added it, and that's why I documented it, and I take it right back out, because it never was there to begin with. Read the thesis, the entire thing. I go on for 10 pages explaining it all, and at the end of this, you will know that the Gospels fit together. There are no errors. They were divinely inspired, and each author gives his piece of the puzzle. When you put it together, ladies and gentlemen, you've got the screenplay. Let the movie play, and you are gonna be blessed. So, oh, so, now I think we gotta take a quick break because uh, we're going over to the girls, uh, Annie and Laura, uh, with a root review. Annie, Laura. I'm Annie. And I'm Laura. And you're here in time for the Rude Review. All right, Annie, you've got some explaining to do. <laughs> Every week at Rude Review, it seems like you've got some really cool little thing going on. Last week you had a little calligraphy set. Now this, what, what's, what's this the deal? This is February's love gift. Okay, I know what these are. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know what those are. Tell well, me about it. This is a mezuzah, and it comes from the land of Israel. And then we also have a anointing oil that we're going to send you along with the little tea light. Which smells really good. They I do. They're fragrance. And um, we have over seven different ones, so everyone will get a variation. All right, so I remember like a year ago, we did a mezuzah, right? It was, it was a different type. <laughs> and everybody kept calling in and email and posting on Facebook that they wanted them, but we were sold out. Correct. So. <clears throat> well, what happens with these love gifts is a lot of times these are handmade and they're one of a kind items. So we can't reproduce them. We can't order more from the manufacturer just because they are, they are handmade. Okay. So once you get it or once we offer it, that is it. Public service announcement time. I'm gonna give my official public service announcement. Ladies and gentlemen, if you contacted a Rude Awakening last year looking for a mezuzah and you got the unfortunate information that we were sold out, right now you have an opportunity to get another one. So go to our website. <laughs> and this one has a scroll too and you can actually see it. So it's a visible reminder of keeping the scripture in your entryway. It's beautiful. I know, can I, have I love one? it. Of course you can. Yay. So for what, a donation. What do of, I do? <laughs> that was my question. <laughs> ah, she beat me to it. <laughs> for your donation of 100, or excuse me, for $50 or more, you will get the Feast for Family uh, Hanukkah and Purim book. You will also receive the DVD teaching set of Purim, and you will receive the anointing oil with a tea light. So now, that's for 50. That's for 50. Okay. For your donation of $100 or more, you will get all of it, including the mezuzah. Okay, so it's automatic. They go to the love gift page, they give 50, they get this. They give correct. 100 or more, they It'll get that. Correct. Okay, that's easy. Yes, it I, is. I could do that. Now, after Purim, 
comes Passover. And yes. I hear you have some Passover news. I do have Passover news. I have a Passover reminder. Okay. As you know, as of February 17th, the Passover price is going to change. So from now until February 17th, if you register for Passover, you will get your Passover registration ticket price of $79. If you wait after February 17th, registration cost will be $99. So you want to do it soon so that you can take advantage of that early bird pricing. From now until Passover, the children's rate will remain $29. So that will be the same. This price does include the gorgeous, wonderful, you'll never forget at night of your life, Saturday night Seder with the Rood crew, with Michael Rood, and it's called Dinner with the King of Kings. Now, I do have a question. I have an <clears> answer. <laughs> well, this question is a very popular one. But how do you get to sit up close near the action where Michael Rood and everybody else is? That's a good question. And I have a good answer. Okay. Last year, we got to thinking about how to do these seating charts and how to seat people there. And we thought the only really fair way to do it is first come, first serve. So your seat at the Seder is determined on when you registered your ticket. So the sooner you register, the closer your seat. That is truly fair. Thank you. <laughs> Great idea. Just go to arudeawakening.tv slash Passover 14 and register now. Join us for the King of Kings Feast of the Year. You can also register your hotel room right from that same site. So join us. You're going to want to be there. <laughs> now before we go, I have a Bring It to the World announcement. Okay. Last year in the year of 2013 and in the first little portion of 2014, we had exclusive teachings done by Michael Rood for our ambassadors class. Yes. And these were never going to be reproduced, never offered again, except for our ambassador club members. So what we're going to do before we announce the new Bring It to the World phase, we are offering all of the exclusive teachings, the old ambassador kit for any new signups right now, this month only. So if they sign up, They'll get their kit. Correct. They won't just get like this month or, or one month of the DVDs. They're going to get all of them. They're going to get every single last exclusive teaching. And again, they're never going to be reproduced. So this is your one opportunity to hear Michael Rood's teaching. Oh, that's awesome. So what do they do to get that? All you have to do is go to www.bringittotheworld.com. Do they have to check a box or anything? Once you log into bringittotheworld.com, there's nothing extra. Just fill out the, your name and contact information, and, and you are an ambassador member. You'll get exclusive teachings and, and deals. I know we have some offers. We do. And so right now, January 31st, at this moment, anyone that registers Bring It to the World right now on through, you know, till we run out, We'll get all of those DVDs. Exactly. All of them. They don't have to do anything else. Last opportunity. Oh, that's so easy. <laughs> you know what else you should do, though? Even if you don't have to check a box, you should join us next week when we bring you the Rude Review. Shabbat Shalom, Torah fans. Thank you, ladies. And now our Messianic Minstrel this week, Steve Ladd, with a cut from his newest CD, One More River. Then I invite you to join me in the Tent of Abraham for the Kiddush, and then tonight's episode, From Here to Eternity, the Gospel of the Revelation, and the Demise of the New World Order, The Mark of the Beast, and the New World Order. Now, ladies and gentlemen, Steve Ladd. Steve? Leaving my trouble behind Well, I got a one more battle with the devil And I know he'll understand I'm going through with Jesus, hallelujah Holding to his nail-scarred hand Oh, holding to his nail-scarred hand mm -hmm. I'm going through with Jesus, hallelujah I'm going through with Jesus, hallelujah Traditions that we inherited from Babylon through Constantine 
have us occasionally with a little plastic cup and a little round wafer in a church service having what is called communion. But Yeshua was not having communion with his disciples. It was the last meal before his crucifixion, which happened at the time the Passover lambs were being sacrificed the following morning. Yeshua took this opportunity to explain something that had been embedded in the, the Israelite culture for then over a thousand years. Melexotic brought forth bread and wine to Abraham, and he blessed the Most High, saying, Baruch Atah Yehovah, Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, HaMotzi Lechem Min HaAretz. Blessed are you, Yehovah, our Elohim, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. Yeshua said, this represents my body, which will be broken for you. As often as you do it, you do it in remembrance of me. And so we break this bread and we do it in remembrance of him. Likewise, Yeshua took the cup and he blessed the Most High with that blessing that Melech Zadik blessed the Most High. Baruch Atah Yehovah, Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, Borei Pari HaGafen. Blessed are you, Yehovah our Elohim, the King of the universe, the creator of the fruit of the vine. Yeshua said, this represents my shed blood, which will be poured out for the remission of sin. I will not drink another drop of the fruit of the vine. You take my cup and divide it among yourselves because I won't drink it until I drink it again with you in my Father's kingdom. In the marriage supper of the Lamb, Yeshua will lift this cup and he will say, Lahai, to life everlasting. And until then, we remember what he's done and remember that marriage supper of the Lamb Get ready. This is from here to eternity, the good news of the apocalypse and the demise of the new world order. The mark of the beast and the new world order. We are now in the parentheses, after the seventh and last trumpet sounds, after the resurrection of the righteous saints, when his servants, the prophets, small and great, are raised and rewarded, now he will destroy those destroyers of the earth. Now will come to pass what is referred to as the third woe, and this comes at the time of the seventh trumpet. But the third woe is the wrath of the Lamb, the wrath of the Almighty poured out upon the earth. But before that happens, we see the scene in heaven, as it tells us in the 19th verse of chapter 11, the temple of Yahweh was open in heaven. The Ark of the Covenant was once again seen in his temple. There was lightning, voices, thunder, and earthquake, and a great hail. And we go all the way to chapter 15, verse 5, and it again repeats the very same thing. What it sets in between is a parenthesis, and we saw at the close of our last episode is that the first parentheses is referring to the birth of Yeshua, the great sign in the heavens, that the dragon stood before the woman immediately to devour her child, but was unsuccessful, and then the man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, the son of man, the, uh, the Messiah himself, the son of the Most High, then is caught up before the throne in heaven. And then the next section where we are now is chapter 12, verse six. This is the next parenthetical section. This is the war in the heavens. In verse six, the woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared by Yahweh so that they should feed her there 1,260 days. Again, we see this exact figure 1260 days, which is 42 months, which is a time, times and a half a time, or three and a half years. And we see that this is the, the very thing that uh, it says the woman. Now, the first time when it talks about a woman clothed with the sun, you know, it's talking about the constellation Betula, 
literally, and that uh, upon the earth, the counterpart, or the prophetic counterpart of that was Miriam. She was travailing in birth, about to be delivered, and she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations. Now we see the woman, as is speaking of here, fleeing into the wilderness, uh, speaking of Israel itself. As Miriam was part of Israel, and the sign in the heavens was speaking of not only Israel, but a woman of Israel bringing forth the Messiah. Now we see the woman flees in the wilderness where she has a place prepared for her for 1,260 days. And there was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought. They did not prevail. They were attempting, Satan was attempting to continue to kateko, as it says in 2 Thessalonians chapter two, to hold fast to his position as accuser brother of the brethren before the throne, but they were unsuccessful because we see that Michael and his angels take him out of the mesos, as it reads, in 2 Corinthians chapter two and six times in the book of the Revelation. Mesos is the midst of the floor of the throne room of the Almighty where Satan does have authority to accuse the brethren night and day. But it says now that they did not prevail in this war and it's an upcoming war. Neither was their previous place recognized in heaven anymore. No more authority to do so. Satan has stripped his authority Now Michael's angels then war against him and he cast him down and it says in verse nine that the great dragon was cast down. That old serpent called the devil in Hasatan who deceives the whole world, he was cast down to the earth and his angels were cast down with him. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven proclaiming, now is come salvation and strength in the kingdom of Yehovah and the power of his Messiah. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, whom accused them before our God day and night. And it says that the saints overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. So the saints take a stand on the earth When Satan is cast down, they don't love their lives unto the death, and so they're just going for broke. They're going for the eternal reward. And and there's gonna be a time that, you know, that that that's it. It's just, ladies and gentlemen, it's almost time to sit your hair on fire and run through the neighborhood naked. It's almost getting down to that. Because you gotta wake people up. You have to do whatever's necessary. That's why I do what I do the way I do it. The people that think, oh, he's too excited, whine, or he hollers too much or whatever, oh, go whine to somebody else. I really don't care, all right? I do care about eternal life, your eternal life. Somebody's gotta wake you up. We're not playing religion here. Religion goes to hell. Religion is the broad path that leads to destruction. Religion, that's it. Religion is man's attempt at finding the way. Forget it, there's no way. Religion is the path to hell. You wanna go directly to hell? Become a Muslim. Excellent idea. That's the path to hell. Become any religion. Become become a Buddhist, become anything. I mean, it's just just nonsense. Man-made nonsense. The Messiah, Yeshua, is the Messiah. He is the prophet who shows us the path to life. You don't want to follow him? Fine, go to hell. Somebody's got to go, it might as well be you. These people didn't love their life to death. They weren't trying to be politically correct. They were thrown right in the face of the new world order, and they didn't give a flying snort in the wind. Then it says, verse 12, therefore rejoice, rejoice, you who dwell in the heavens, but woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea. The devil has come down to you with great wrath because he knows he has 
but a short time. Now this is a time of Satan's wrath. He is absolutely furious and when he comes down, he inhabits completely the man of sin, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God, so that he as God sits in the temple of God, proclaiming that he himself is God. That has not happened yet. The abomination of desolation has not happened yet. But this is a parenthesis showing what is going to happen. When this war in heaven takes place at the time of the war upon earth and the destroyer is revealed, Satan knows he has but a short time. And so when the dragon realized that he was cast down and confined to the earth, he persecuted the woman who brought forth the man child. But the woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place prepared where she is to be nourished for a time, times, and half a time, away from the face of the serpent. And so there is a provision for the woman. You know, Yeshua said, if you're in Jerusalem, get out, get out immediately. Why? Because there's a place prepared. Where is it? I don't know. But who is able to lead us at that time? Yeshua. There's a place prepared for her. And it says then in verse 15, the serpent spewed out a flood of water out of his mouth after the woman so that he might cause her to be swept away by the flood, but the earth helped the woman. And the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood and the, which the dragon cast out of his mouth. Now, we see that water, sea, flood, a lot of times represents a great mass of humanity. And you can imagine that if Israel flees into the wilderness, that the armies of the new world order are gonna stop at nothing. But as, as we see them go out, cast a flood after her, that the earth swallows up the flood. It swallows up whatever it is that's sent after to destroy her. And that's the only way you, that you could possibly survive. Now, uh, uh, some, uh, would, would say that Petra is the place to hide. Now, in ancient times before airplanes, uh, yeah, you could get away with it, but uh, with infrared and everything else, it doesn't, make any, it doesn't make sense nowadays that Petra would be a place of protection. But then again, the Almighty is able to hide his people in plain sight, and the earth is able to swallow up anything that you send after them. And so, It says in verse 17, so the dragon was wroth with a woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed that keeps the commandments of Yahovah, the remnant of her seed. We have to remember that Israel has been scattered all over the face of the earth. Even uh, the the smaller number, not the 10 tribes which have been scattered, but, but the area of Judea, those who lived in Judea, which later became known as Yehudim or Jews, those uh, Israelites who became known as Jews, they've been scattered all over the world, but that's a much smaller number, and it was done at a much later time. And still today, we see that people are waking up all over the world and, and finding out that they have Jewish ancestry. Now, Jewish or the Judeans, those of the lower tribes of Judea, as they're waking up and finding out, hey, you know, we were scattered out, we have lost contact with our ancestors, they tried to hide who we were, well, that's basically two tribes. You know, and of course, a lot of the northern tribes did come down into Judea at different points in time, but the 10 northern tribes, See, the Almighty promised Abraham that his seed would become as the sand of the sea, innumerable. We see that China and India are both the same age as Israel. They've got over, what, over a billion people each. How many Israelites are there? They're the only ones who are promised that they would number more than the sands of the seas, more like you, you can't count the number of stars, that's what it would be like. And so now we see that, you know, the dragon is going to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments, number one. You know, this is the first category. 
keeping the commandments, and then having the testimony of Yeshua Messiah. See, those who have a made up Jesus, and which is a lot of churchianity today, you know, they don't know anything about what he teaches. You know, they don't read anything about what he says. They don't teach what he teaches. They just have this Jesus gospel. And it goes something like this, you know, you know, uh, all you have to do is ask Jesus to come into your heart or ask him to be your savior. And all you have to do is ask and, and, and he'll come into your heart and you know, then come to church. You know, do this repeat it after me prayer. That's not what Yeshua taught. It has nothing to do with the gospel of the kingdom. This is something that we have made up in this day and time. Nothing to do whatsoever with the gospel of the kingdom. This is our own good news that we kind of concocted. But see, when you follow Yeshua, you are going to be keeping the commandments. Because once you have been redeemed, once he lives inside you, once the spirit of the Holy One comes inside you and resides within you, you want to be obedient. You, 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 by nature, now a natural man does not subject himself to the commandments of God. He wants nothing to do with them. But once a person is filled with the spirit of the Holy One, he wants to do that which is right. It's his nature to want to obey the commandments. It's like, you know, what, do you, what can I do? You know, I see what you've done for me, what can I do for you? That's a natural response of the supernatural indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And Satan is absolutely furious with those who keep the commandments and have the testimony of Yeshua Messiah, the real testimony, not some kind of made up, concocted religious system, baby Jesus story, no. Are they following what Yeshua said to do? Are they keeping the commandments? Because if they speak not according to the Torah and the commandments, there is no light in them. There is no truth in them. Oh, excuse me, I'm quoting the New Testament. Okay. Well, and now... We see that the devil is wroth. This is after this great war in heaven, and now he's cast down the earth. And how long does he have? A time, times and a half a time. He has 1260 days. He has 42 months. He has uh, three and a half years to get the job done, and he wants to destroy everyone on the planet. Now again, this is a parenthesis. We have already gone through that period of time. The last trump happens on Yom Teruah at the end of this three and a half year period of time where we are saved from the wrath to come as Shaul eloquently says it by the word of Yahovah that we will be saved or rescued from the wrath to come. This is the wrath of the lamb and this hasn't happened yet, ladies and gentlemen. The third woe has not kicked in. We've been rescued, we've been pulled out, now we have a parenthesis to show cause and effect, and we're on our way to the wrath being poured out upon the earth. Now, we move on to the next parenthesis, or within the parenthesis, the parenthesis goes from 12.1 through 15.4, but now we are at 13.1, this is the beast government. Then I stood upon the sand of the sea and watched a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and 10 horns, and upon its horns 10 crowns, and upon its heads was the name of blasphemy. Now today, when we talk about the name of blasphemy, the word blasphemy is insult. And the most probable candidate for the name of blasphemy, we will see as we read the, the entire context is Allah hu Akbar, Allah is greater. This is the ultimate insult against Yehovah, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Allah is a made up, fictitious moon, desert moon God, who is worshiped by, you know, desert wackos, basically, and it's even been brought down into modern day, it's like, you know, didn't anyone think it through? I mean, like one guy, you know, sitting out in a tent in a desert, writes all this stuff up and says he's the prophet? Oh yeah, like, right. Like, uh, you know, anyone who comes on this, it's a cult. This is the ultimate cult, a death cult that goes around and kills people all the time. 
Hundreds of thousands of Christians will die this year at the hands of this moan god cult. This is not to be respected. These people should have gotten a clue. It's like, does anyone teach logic in their world? Goodness gracious. So Mohammed is not a prophet. He was a pedophile. He was, by my most accounts, an epileptic. You know, something was wrong. His wires were crossed up here, and he's a pedophile, and he legitimized pedophilia. And that's why you have, you know, of all these little Syrian girls that are now homeless, now they're being married. You know, these six and eight-year-old little girls, they're not being rescued, they're being married by pedophile Muslims in these other countries. And these little girls, you know, the records are horrendous of them dying of internal bleeding because, you know, an eight-year-old little girl is not supposed to be married to a 40-year-old man. Goodness gracious, talk about sick. This is the sickest religion that has ever been concocted in the sick, twisted mind of man. The most probable candidate for the name of blasphemy, Allahu Akbar. Now, we'll go on. Now, the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were like unto the feet of a bear, and his mouth was like unto the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave it his power and his throne and his great authority. And I see the dragon, when he gives his power and authority, he's cast on the earth, he has but a short time. You can imagine the debauchery that will ensue. And I saw one of its heads as it was wounded unto death, but its deadly wound was healed. And all the world wondered after the beast. Wait, just a minute, ladies and gentlemen. I've heard that, you know, we're talking about, you know, a world leader who will have a head wound. He'll be shot like John Kennedy, and he'll come back to life. Ladies and gentlemen, People don't have seven heads, all right? Governments are, you know, are referred to as the beast government, and one of these heads of this beast government, and it's not an individual, it's the heads, it's, it's, the, it's the manifestations of this government has a wound as unto death. But its deadly wound was healed, and the world wondered after the beast. Now, I wanna point out something here that the beast mentioned here in the Revelation, lion, bear, leopard, and man, were the focal point of Daniel's prophetic vision concerning Babylon, Persia, Greece, and the Roman empires, which is detailed in in Daniel chapter seven. The land masses of each of these ancient civilizations now comprise the nations of Iran, Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, Turkey, Greece, Egypt, Arabia, and several other Middle Eastern countries that are now under full Islamic control. Remember, when Yohanan was writing this revelation, there was no such thing as Muslim wackos. There's no such, you know, there's no person such as Muhammad, hadn't even made up this religion yet. But yet he is taken into the future in seeing this very thing. Well, ladies and gentlemen, let's go to Daniel chapter seven, a very instructive chapter. Here we see the uh, precessor of what we had read in a previous session in in chapter eight when it talks about, uh, this is the third year of the reign of uh, Belshazzar that Daniel saw a vision and he says that Uh, It was after that which appeared to him at the first. Now, what is this appeared at the first? I didn't deal with it then because now we can go back and see chapter seven, verse one. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head upon his bed. Then he wrote the dream and told the sum of the matter. So the first was the first year of the reign of Belshazzar. This is when Daniel had this previous revelation during this time. And verse two, Daniel spoke and said, I saw my vision by night, and behold, four winds of heaven strove upon the great sea. Again, the same terminology in the book of the Revelation, out of the sea a beast arose. And it says that the four great beasts came out of the sea, diverse from one another. The first was like unto a lion, and had eagle's wings, I beheld until the wings thereof were plucked, 
and it was lifted up from the earth and made to stand upon the feet as a man, and a man's heart was given unto us. This is Babylon, the Babylonian Empire. Then, and I beheld, uh, verse five, another beast, a second, like to a bear, and it raised up itself on one side, and it had three ribs in the mouth of it, and between the teeth of it, and they said thus unto that beast, like a bear, arise and devour much flesh. And so now we have the kingdoms of Media and Persia, raised up on one side, the Persian empire predominating. And then verse six, and after this I beheld and lo another, like unto a leopard, which had upon the back of it four wings of a fowl, and the beast had also four heads, and dominion was given unto it. And this is, uh, as Daniel had a later prophetic vision of this, of a he-goat which had one substantial predominant horn that ran against and destroyed the ram of Media Persia which had the two horns, and when, when it was strong, then the horn was broken and for it up came four other horns. Here, it's a leopard and showing with four wings. Again, as the Grecian Empire, which took all the land from landmass from Macedonia to the Indus River down to Ethiopia, and it had four heads, Egypt, Assyria, Turkey, and Greece. And then after this, I saw in the night visions, behold, a fourth beast dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth. It devoured and brake in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it, and it was diverse from all the other beasts before it, and it had 10 horns. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we are seeing this manifestation of this beast in the book of the Revelation, now back here in the book of Daniel, and we are seeing that after Greece came up Rome, and the vestiges of the Roman Empire. And what we're going to do is take a short break now before we go into the history of what happened in the Roman Empire where out of the 10 horns, then three were subdued and taken out of the, out of the, the mix, but then out of the Roman Empire comes up another empire and that becomes the new world order. We're gonna take a break now and this is where we give you an opportunity to join all of us in our completely focused assault on planet Earth through the media. As Yeshua said, this gospel of the kingdom, the one he was teaching, must be preached in all the world for a witness. This is our commission. This is what he sent his apostles out to do, his disciples, and the commission continues on to this day. It wasn't just theirs, it's ours. And we have eternal reward for what we do. We're asking you to get under and shoulder the load with us, ladies and gentlemen. We are shouldering the load. There are many in the Ambassador Club who are standing with us. We need some serious help to get this out. We have some major projects that need to be done and we're calling upon you because we need some serious help. We wanna be on the air all over this country and other countries, and we need your help. We need serious help at this point. Please, stand with us. We'll give you a few moments.
the most vicious beast, which subdued all other kingdoms. It says, had 10 horns. In verse eight of Daniel chapter seven, I considered the horns and behold, there came up among them another little horn before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up. And we see that in the rise and fall of the Roman Empire, that by 476 AD, we had out of the Roman Empire, the Lombards, which is Italy, the Franks, which is France, the Burgundians, which is Switzerland, the Suave, which is Portugal, the Alemanni, which is Germany, the Anglo-Saxons, which is Britain, the Visigoths, which is Spain, the Ostrogoths, the Huli, and the Vandals, all 10 of these nations, of these people groups, were subdued by the Roman Empire, and they are all part of the Roman Empire. But then the Pope and Emperor Justinian was the one who completely destroyed and obliterated the Astrogoths, the Heruli, and the Vandals. And so of the first 10, these three were plucked up by an act of the Holy Roman Empire who completely obliterated these people. And as I mentioned before, that the Holy Roman Empire was responsible for the murder of over 60 million people. And that is a conservative estimate, ladies and gentlemen, the most bloody empire in the history of planet Earth. And we're gonna see, let's see if, if this fits, because we're just looking at history, we're looking at these things to see if they fit. And it says that, that uh, by, uh, excuse me, I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were the eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking great things. I beheld until thrones, the, the thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like unto pure wool. His throne was like a fly, fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. A fiery stream issued, and came forth from before him, thousands of thousands ministered unto him, and 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him, and the judgment was set, and the books were opened. So Daniel's incredible vision here shows that the end of this Roman Empire, which is still going on today, ladies and gentlemen, if you take a look at the makeup of America, the melting pot, where did all these people come from until just recently? out of the Roman Empire, all to the United States of America. And so the end of this is that the Almighty is going to rule over. There is nothing that is gonna keep his empire from completely consuming and dominating the earth. And then in verse 11, I beheld then, because of the voice of the great words which the horn spake, I beheld even till the beast was slain and his body was destroyed and given to the burning flame. As concerning the rest of the beasts, they had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. And I saw in the night visions, behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the ancient of days, and they brought him near before him, and there was given to him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and language should serve him. The, and his dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom shall not be destroyed. And that is speaking of the kingdom of the Messiah. This is the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven. And this is what the, the rabbis recognize. This is referring to the Messiah who will rule over all the earth. And Daniel said that he was grieved in his spirit and in the midst of his body. And the, the, the visions of my head troubled me. And so he's asking for some clarity on, on all this. In verse seven it says, these great beasts, which are four, are four kings, which shall arise out of the earth, but the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. And then he wanted to know more about this, this fourth beast 
who was exceeding dreadful, in verse 19, whose teeth were of iron, nails of brass, who devoured in broken pieces and stamped the residue of his feet. And of the 10 horns, verse 20, that were in his hand, and of the other which came up and before whom three fell, even that horn which had eyes and a mouth which spake very great things, whose look was more stout than his fellow. And I beheld in that same horn made war with the saints and prevailed against them until the Ancient of Days came and judgment was given to the saints of the Most High and the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom. So we are seeing that a revival out of this, of this, what was the Roman world and everything that they covered, and they covered all of these areas, again, which are now dominated by Muslim religious fanatics. And now we see that this is sweeping over Europe. As Muammar Gaddafi said, you know, we don't need to take Europe by force. In 50 years, we will overpopulate, we will, we will own Europe. And now in the United States of America, a, a country where you can't have a manger scene in public anymore, they're stopping traffic in downtown New York while Muslims get out and completely cover the streets and bow down to an, a fictitious moon god as they you know, put their butts in the air facing Mecca, okay? You know, it's sweeping America. We have the President of the United States who says that Christians and Muslims and Jews worship the same God. Talk about clueless. I'll talk, this is a real pawn of the New World Order. Anyone that is so absolutely clueless, he doesn't even know what the leaders of his own religion are saying. The leaders of his own religion, oh, of course, he says he's a Christian because he's learned much from the historical Jesus. If I said I, I'm a Christian because I've learned much from the historical Jesus, you would throw me out as a complete heretic. But the President of the United States says, it, oh, he must be a Christian because he's learned much from the historical Jesus. That's exactly how Muslim would say it, people. I mean, let's hear his real testimony conversion. Let's see how Yeshua has really changed his life and, and set his heart on fire and, and getting the gospel of the kingdom. Oh yeah, right. Yeah, this guy doesn't have a clue what the gospel of the kingdom is. Why he sat in the pew with Jeremiah Wright, one of the most clueless people I've ever had the insult of my intelligence listening to. He sat there and listened to this guy. I wouldn't sit there for 15 minutes. The guy's a complete biblical illiterate. But yet he sat there and listened to it. Ladies and gentlemen, this thing is ripe for the picking because out of the United Nations, which is developed in the United States, is where is coming the new world order that is unleashing the Muslim hordes all over the planet. I don't know, this may be my last broadcast. You, know, you never know when they're gonna pull the plug on us, okay? You never know. But at least, at least I, I'm, uh, you know, we once had freedom of speech in America, okay? We once did. It used to be protected. But, you know, they, they come after you in every, every possible avenue to shut you up because, you know, they've got the big guns. Huh. Just ask uh, David Koresh. I'm sorry, he's, he's, he's in the grave along with about 100 other people who, who spoke out against some of these things. Plus, he spoke out a lot of other nutty things. But here we go, ladies and gentlemen. Now, <clears throat> We're gonna, we're gonna halt here because we're gonna be later, deeper in the Revelation, we're gonna see some more detail. Now we're in verse four, the beast government. Verse four, the world worshiped the dragon which gave power to the beast, and they worshiped the beast saying, who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with it? And there was given, and there was given to it, the beast, a mouth speaking great things and blasphemy. We read that in the seventh chapter of Daniel. And power is given to the beast to continue 42 months. He opened his mouth in blasphemy, in insult against Yehovah. That's what, uh, what, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, I forgot, Allah who Akbar is. It's a blasphemy against Yehovah to blaspheme his holy name and his tabernacle and those who dwell in heaven. He was given the power to make war with the saints and to overcome them. 
Power was given him over all families and tongues and nations. All those who dwell upon the earth shall worship him, that is, all those whose names are not written in the scroll of life by the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Now, we're gonna continue on, ladies and gentlemen. Right now, now we go into the mark of the beast. Verse 13, verse nine, chapter 13, nine. If any man has an ear, let him hear. He who leads into captivity shall go into captivity. He who kills with a sword shall be killed with a sword. Here's the enduring patience and faith of the saints. Just understand that there, if you decide to take up an arm against the new world order, it doesn't matter if they have to nuke your house. They will do whatever it takes to kill you. If you live by the sword, you are going to be butchered by them. Okay, but he who leads into captivity is going to go into captivity as well. There is going to be justice in the end. Verse 11, then I saw another beast coming out of the earth. He had two horns like a lamb, but he spoke like a dragon. He exercised all the authority of the first beast who came before him, and he caused the earth and all those who dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. See, it's a government, a government whose deadly wound was healed. And out of the ashes, the phoenix of this, comes forth the new world order, the Novus Order Seclorum. After the destruction of all ordered governments, out of the ashes arises the new world order. It says that he did great wonders and made fire to come down from heaven onto the earth in the sight of all men. He deceived all those who dwell on earth by means of the miracles which he had the power to do under the authority of the beast. He instructed all those who dwell on the earth to make an image of the beast which had a wound by the sword and yet lived. And then verse 15, the dragon lamb, as I've coined the phrase, dragon lamb, because he spoke like, he was a lamb, but he spoke like a dragon. The dragon lamb had the power to give life to the image of the beast so that the image of the beast could both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. In verse 16, and the dragon lamb caused all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark on their right hand or in their forehead, so that no man might buy or sell except those who have the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. Here's wisdom. Let him who has understanding decipher the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is ki, ksi, sigma. It's the number of man, the number or mark, or the name of the beast is written in the ancient Greek text of the book of the Revelation as three characters, ki, xi, and sigma. Not as the number 666, which is hexakosai, hexakonta, and hex. Hexacosi, hexaconta, hex is 666, but that's now how it's written in the ancient text. It's written in Greek characters, which you'll now look at on your screen. Ki, kisi, and sigma. Now, if, if, now John is looking at this, and the linguistic evidence is very strong that Yohanan wrote his revelation in the Hebrew language. Yet the Greek language has been embedded in the Galilee region for hundreds of years, and these characters would not have been unfamiliar to him. He's seeing something, but presuming that Yohanan saw these three Greek characters in the vision, we can simply rotate them 90 degrees. As you see in your screen now, rotating them 90 degrees to see their preeminence in these very figures in the modern Islamic Basmala. The Basmala is by far the most prolific artistic expression observed throughout the Muslim world. The Basmala is the artistic symbol which bears the acronym, and this is the acronym, in the name of Allah, most gracious, most merciful. Okay, first of all, that is an insult. Allah 
is fictitious. He is not most gracious because Yahovah is most gracious. Yahovah is most merciful. This is an absolute insult against the one true God. But John, John doesn't see Arabic, he sees these figures, and these are the figures that you see in this basmala. The key, okay, the key, which is now on its side, now you see the X. Now you see the Kasi, which on its side looks like what, what we would think in a, a script W, but that is the representation of in the name of Allah. Uh, this squiggle, this squiggle, um, you know, all you have to do is scrunch it together and you have that very same image on the ring worn by a very famous figure in America today. You just bring that all together in an artistic representation and that's what you've got. Today, this name of insult against the one true God is worn on the headbands and on the right arms of Islamic Jihad, holy war terrorist as well as on the uniformed soldiers of Muslim armies who are sworn to the destruction of the nation Israel, the extermination of the Jewish people, and the slaughter of the Christians as well. See, John is seeing things in the future. And have we not arrived at the time or near the time where we are seeing these things play out. Now, there's also another very strong possibility here that everything that is sold, everything that is sold in bookstores must have on it, including the mystery of iniquity, sold in Christian bookstores all over the world, and a lot of the information that I'm sharing with you is in The Mystery of Iniquity. If you want to review, this is the book to get. This is The Mystery of Iniquity. This details the legal prerequisites to the return of the Messiah. And on the back of it, we have a UPC code. The computers read this UPC code. It has three sets of of thin lines at the beginning, in the middle, and the end. There is a shorter version of the UPC where it has two sets of long lines at the beginning at one at the end. And why is this? Because the, the code reader sees these lines, and you can check it out, because anything over on this side, on the, on the far right side, when you see the number six, you'll see that it's two thin lines separated by a medium space. The, the reader reads that as a six. It also reads the beginning number as a six, the middle as a six, and the end as a six. When you have those three numbers in place, six, 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 when it can read all three sixes, then it knows it has the entire code. That's why if it's a short version with two sixes together, it still sees six, six, six. So it reads this as a code. And so you cannot buy or sell in the marketplace now without this mark being on all merchandise that is sold. Now what are we missing? We're missing the other part of it, which would be a mark on the right hand or in the forehead that would be your personal reader code. That then we could go to a completely cashless society because first of all, we are off the gold standard. There's no such thing as a gold standard because the world bankers have all the gold and in billions were, were looted from the World Trade Centers, uh, and that was the last of major gold heist, and the biggest one, as far as we know of, in the history of planet Earth, was taking the, the World Trade Centers down, uh, right, uh, and they got just about all the gold out of there uh, before it happened. I think their timing was just a little bit off in one of the trucks, and uh, in several of the, the escape vehicles uh, that was used uh, apparently in the looting, as we, we get the information, uh, was uh, trapped down in the building. And, uh, and so, but the biggest gold hoist, uh, all, the, all you know, the, the gold is in the hands of someone else. I don't think there's anything left at Fort Knox uh, to, to guard there, except the secret that there's probably not anything there. Because we're completely off the gold standard, we're on the Federal Reserve System. Federal Reserve is not, 
uh, anything to do with the federal government, it has to do with the world bankers, it's a private enterprise, and this we documented fully in our earlier uh, sessions. But it is this very thing that, that would lead to a completely cashless society when they deliberately trash and crash every monetary system on the planet because everything is off the gold standard at this point. But I'll tell you, there's gonna be a fight to the finish for who really runs the new world order when it all comes down. We've got China, we've got Rome, we've got the United Nations, we've got them all in play and it is going to be one bloody mess. Now, we're going to go to one more section right here and this is the 144,000, the first fruits before the throne. Remember, we are in a parentheses here. The last time we saw the, the 144,000 is just at the time that they are being sealed, and that is before stripping uh, the seventh seals, between the sixth and the seventh seal. And now, that right after the seventh trumpet sounds and before the mayhem begins with the wrath of the Almighty, we see, the 144,000, the first fruits before the throne. Verse, chapter 14, verse one. I looked and I saw a lamb standing on Mount Zion. And with him were, who's this lamb standing on Mount Zion? Well, we know. And with them were 144,000, having his father's name written on their foreheads. What's the father's name? Yehovah, yod Hey vav Hey. Not old, what's his name, Hashem. Not, you know, not, not Lord, it's yod heh vav -Hey. That's what's written on their foreheads, and most of the Christian world doesn't even know what his name is. Most of the people in the Jewish world don't, don't know what his name is anymore. They call him Adonai, or old what's-his-name, Hashem. That's what it means, the name, or old what's-his-name. No, the reason he brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand is so that the entire world would know that his name is yod heh vav -Hey, Yahovah. And these 144,000 have the Father's name written on their forehead. And I heard a voice from heaven like the sound of roaring oceans and like the sound of deafening thunder. And I heard the sound of harpers harping with their harps. And they sang a new song before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders, but no one could learn the song except for the 144,000 who were redeemed from the earth. And when were they redeemed from the earth? At the sounding of the seventh trumpet. These are the ones who were not defiled, who were not defiled with women, not defiled with women. They were not prostituted to the world system. It's not that women defile men, not in marriage. For they kept themselves as virgins. And after marriage, the marriage bed is undefiled. They are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. They were redeemed out from among men, being the first fruits to Yehovah and to the Lamb. In their mouth was found no guile, and they are without fault. These are the ones who kept themselves pure from forbidden sexual activity or erva matters, as it reads in the Torah. And when a man and a woman are married in the state of Virginia, there's no defilement. The marriage bed is undefiled. And, you know, it's clear. You know, it's, this is the way the Creator made it. This passage in no way implies that marriage is forbidden for those who are among the chosen and sealed 144,000. It simply means that they were not defiled by inappropriate sexual activity while they were unmarried and remained faithful to their spouses afterwards. In a spiritual sense, however, they are not contaminated by the Babylonian religious, economic, and political systems, which Yohanan described as a whore. So, Babylon's judgment is now going to be declared, and we're gonna have to pick this up next time. And I'd like to close with prayer. Abba Father, thank you for covering us. Thank you for choosing us. Thank you for illuminating your word to us. Bring us under the shadow of your wings. Teach us and keep us close in your hand. Protect us in the time of trouble ahead. 
keep our backbone straight and strong to speak forth the truth of your word. And may we call many to righteousness and turn many to righteousness so they can shine like the stars forever and ever. In Yeshua's name, amen. Shabbat shalom to our fans. Lahitrot, we'll see you later. And uh, make sure that you have a good week. Shavua tov. Bye-bye. <laughs>